much, Devi. And uh, I'd like to start by saying huge thank you to Devi organizing these seminars. It's truly a silver lining of this whole pandemic experiment. So having joining every Wednesday for me, it's 4 p.m. right now in the afternoon and hearing something from great glaciological community, it's fantastic. Another point uh, I want to mention that the results I'll be showing today are obtained in collaboration with Van Kaminium. All great ideas are his, all dumb ones and all errors are mine. So that's how it is. Uh, I would like also to mention before I start going that uh, please ask questions in, in the chat during the talk because uh, if you don't understand something and it's easily clarifiable, please um, do it right away because the talk kind of builds itself. So if you if something is unclear, it may be kind of not unclear late as well. So unlike in usual tradition, saving questions for the later, feel free to ask them during the talk. Um, I'll stop uh, my video if I can, for some reasons I can. Usually my internet connection isn't great, so that would be the reason. But anyhow, uh, if the title of this talk reads to you as a conclusion, because that's what it is, and the purpose of the next 45 slides or so is just to provide the um, arguments that support this conclusion. But the first... Um, Things just uh, let me find a spotlight that I could easily share. Uh, okay, some reasons doesn't work. Um, so something isn't right. What are you looking for, Olga? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I wanted the spotlight, got it. So here is the spotlight. So Fantastic. you can see it on the screen, wonderful. Uh, so first things first, uh, the subject, but for some reasons like, okay, now I can't advance. Uh, the subject of this talk is marine ice sheets. Marine ice sheets are ice sheets that are sit in bed, which is below sea level. And what I'm looking over here is the, product of metamorphic and GAMS uh, bad machines, the Antarctica on the left the, uh, and Greenland on the right. As you can see, uh, there are a lot of uh, blues and blue, everything in blue and deep blue is below sea level. Everything in green and brown is above sea level and there are a lot of places that are um, indeed below sea level. This, uh, this uh, cartoon shows the vertical cross section of a marine ice sheet. It sits in a bed denoted by B, which is below sea level, and its horizontal extent is limited uh, by the location when ice goes afloat. Ice has to go afloat because, as you all well know, the density of ice is less than the density of water, and that means it has to float. The location when it does it uh, go the fluid is called the grounding line, and it is determined by the flotation condition, which is nothing else as the Archimedes principle that the thickness at the grounding line is proportional to the bed elevation and to the ratio of the uh, two densities. Uh, the focus of this talk is marine ice sheet instability or vertments marine ice sheet instability, which has been used for past, I don't know, almost four decades uh, to explain the observations of the present day ice sheets, paleo ice sheets, and also to interpret uh, projections of um, ice sheet behavior in the future. Uh, this uh, hypothesis of marine ice sheet instability hypothesis traces its roots to a paper published by Hans Wertmann, in which he concluded that an ice sheet that rests on the flat bed, flat before the ice sheet uh, was placed on it, situated below sea level, is inherently unstable. So this inherent instability is the marine ice sheet instability. Depending upon the depth of the bed below sea level, the ice sheet either will shrink in size until it disappears, or it will grow until its edge is at the border of the continental shelf. A stable ice sheet can occur if the bed slopes away from the center of the ice sheet. And last, the best sentence, the generalization of our results 
uh, to other bad shapes is rather obvious. So, but uh, before we get how, uh, to a point how uh, Hans Wertmann arrived to that conclusions, we need a few basic facts, and these are facts about marine ice sheets. They gain their mass by accumulating through snow through uh, the air surface, and they lose mass by transporting it through the ground and line. Uh, and actually, this transport of flux uh, through the ground and line is the contribution of an ice sheet to sea level. As soon as ice crosses the ground and line, it's done its job to contributing, contributing to sea level. Uh, both uh, of the, the uh, gain of the mass through the surface and the loss um, through the ground and line, QG and A dot, they have physical meaning of air flux and mass flux. Uh, the accumulation or this uh, net accumulation is determined by the atmospheric conditions and the climate conditions, and the flux through the ground the line is determined um, by the ice flow through the interior of the whole ice sheet and whatever rise to the ground the line that fl uh, flux is. But it would be great to know what it is. Uh, so what the ground and line does depends on the relationship of these two fluxes. If the net accumulation exceeds the flux through the ground and line, then the ground and line advances. If uh, the uh, net accumulation is less than the flux through the ground and line, then the ground and line retreats. And if the two happen to balance each other, then the ground and line is in equilibrium. And uh, I want to make a distinction that an equilibrium does not mean a steady state. Obviously, when the ice sheet and steady state that these two fluxes balance each other, but if the accumulation changes with time, and it so happens that the flux through the ground line adjusts itself to balance that accumulation, that the ground line is in equilibrium, although the whole system is not in steady state. So, uh, as I said, it would be really good to know what that flux at the ground line is. And uh, Bertman, in his analysis, came up um, that the flux at the ground line is proportional. This pump sign is proportional to the ice thickness in some power, which is greater than one. In other words, that the flux increases as the ice thickness at the ground line increases. Some 30 years later, uh, Christian Schuff revisited the problem. He used a more sophisticated model uh, that included uh, power law basal sliding, but arrived to somewhat uh, uh, quantitatively similar expressions that the flux at the ground in line proportional to the ice thickness, again, in some positive power, meaning it, uh, the flux getting larger as the ice thickness increases. And so we have all information now to follow Workman's arguments. Uh, if we consider a steady state position, the middle one, in steady state, as I told you, the two fluxes, the flux through the ground and line QG, and the accumulation um, through net accumulation through the whole surface of the ice sheet, they exactly, exactly balance each other, they equal each other. Now, if this ground in line slightly perturbed from its steady state position, say upstream from its steady state position, uh, on the retrograde bed or the bed that gets deeper into the interior, that means that bed, the bed gets slightly deeper. And because of the flotation conditions, the flux, the, I'm sorry, the thickness at the ground line has to be slightly larger. And according to the uh, Portman's expression, the flux through the ground line has to be larger than the flux uh, is at the steady state. On the other hand, because the uh, ground in line is slightly upstream. That means that horizontal extent of the ice sheet is a little bit smaller than in the steady state. That means it accumulates slightly less mass through its surface. Because remember, again, steady state and the accumulation rate or precipitation rate does not change with time. And I, as I just told you a couple slides ago, if the flux through the ground in line exceeds the accumulation through the surface, the grounding line has to retreat. 
as it retreats, the bed gets deeper, the eye sickness gets larger, and the flux through the grounding line gets even larger than it was in the steady state. But because uh, the grounding line is slightly upstream, the horizontal extent is even smaller, so the eye sheet shrinks. The surface area through which it can accumulate mass is even smaller. And again, the ground line has to keep retreating because the accumulation through the surface is always smaller in, in, into the interior of the ice sheet, but the flux through the ground line is always larger because uh, the bed is deeper and consequently the thickness of the ground line is larger. So uh, that means that as if the ground line is slightly perturbed upstream from its steady state position, it has to keep moving until the ice sheet collapses. The argument works in the opposite direction. If the ground line is, slight up, is perturbed slightly upstream from its steady state position, the bed is slightly shallow, the eye thickness is slightly smaller, the flux is slightly smaller, uh, the flux through the ground in line is slightly smaller than in steady state position. But on the other hand, the horizontal extent of the ice sheet is slightly larger. That means it can accumulate more mass through the surface. And as I told you a few slides ago, that means the ground in line has to advance. In this position, uh, the same uh, happens. The bed is even uh, shallower, the thickness smaller, the flux is smaller, but the accumulation is larger, and so the ground line has to keep advancing until it reaches the edge of the continental shelf. So uh, I want to emphasize that this um, instability argument strongly hinges upon this expression that the flux through the ground line has to increase with the increasing ice thickness. Uh, meaning these two, the uh, flux as a function of phi, increasing function of phi thickness and the instability, they are directly connected. So the instability argument works if the flux is increasing a function of phi thickness and conversely, if it so happens that the flux is increasing function of phi thickness, then the ice sheet on the retrograde bed uh, has to be unstable, has to collapse or advance. Uh, if are there any questions in, at this point, or we can proceed, because this is pretty much the Vertman marine ice sheet instability hypothesis in its, in its nutshell. All right, uh, so because the expression that Christian should derived is fairly simple. It's extremely tempting to use that as a parameterization of uh, flux at the ground line in ice sheet models. And this slide shows a few examples of papers describing results of with obtained with models that use such a parameterization. But always comes but. So uh, as we uh, already seen in um, this paper, Wertman uh, was uh, looking at an ice sheet that rested on a flat bed, flat before ice sheet was placed on it, so it, its bed is extremely smooth. And uh, in um, a model or in configuration that should have considered again, the bed varies on very long spatial scale, so the bed slopes are uh, very small, and indeed they were neglected in um, his considerations. Uh, what's shown on the left is bad elevation in the Amundsen Sea embayment and um, under the Waits Glacier. The red line shows a cross section where the um, topography is shown on the right in um, the, the bed um, under the Waits is neither very flat nor it is uh, very smooth. So um, when st one starts learning glaciology, the, the first thing they are um, taught, they had, uh, the fundamental control, uh, the, or the fundamental aspect that determines the ice flow is about topography. So the question is, uh, do all these undulations, troughs, and peaks do the matter uh, for the flux? Uh, through the ground line and 
uh, for the position of the grounding line and its stability. In order to uh, answer this question, we use uh, exactly the same model, absolutely the same model that Chu used for his analysis, but the only difference that we introduce undulations to the bed. Uh, so I have to say right away that the slopes created by these undulations by a factor of three or four smaller than anything on that weight, so it's still an extremely smooth bed. So the bed elevation is shown uh, in by black line. Uh, red symbols show steady state positions of the grounding line for a particular combination of the sliding parameter and accumulation rate. And the blue lines um, should illustrate just two examples of uh, steady state ice uh, sheet configurations. So there are many more corresponding to each ground line position, but um, these are just two examples. So the flux through the ground line uh, for the steady state is shown on the left flux as a function of eye thickness. Colors show different values of the sliding parameter and it's quite a mess. So there is no such a very nice um, uh, relationship between the flux and ice thickness. So for some ground line positions, uh, the flux seems to be kind of an increasing function of ice thickness, but for others, uh, it's rather a decreasing function. It is possible to determine an approximate expression for the flux through the ground and line position you know, if the bad slopes are not negligible and this uh, that middle expression. This is not a new expression, it has been for a while around. Uh, uh, so there are two extra terms in this expression. One is associated with the bed slope and the other one with the accumulation rate. And the other two terms are exactly the same as in Schultz's expression. Uh, the uh, plot on the left has two sets of symbols of the same color. The diamond ones are from this approximate expression and the circle ones are from full numerical simulations. So the, uh, two, the two sets uh, agree quite well, meaning that this approximate expression um, describes the flux at the ground in line fairly well. And this is a steady state expression. So for steady state positions of the ground in line, this is the uh, relationship between the flux and the ice thickness if the bed slopes are not neglected. The plot on the right shows the uh, ratio between uh, two fluxes. One is computed, or rather these are circles, one is numerically computed and the other one is using Schultz's expression. The vertical scale is a logarithmic scale. For fairly strong beds or high uh, basal friction coefficients, uh, the, relation, the ratio is within a couple orders of magnitudes. And as the bed gets more and more slippery, the ratio increases and the full range is about four orders of magnitude uh, in both directions, meaning the uh, Schiff's expression underestimates and overestimates the flux at the ground in line by orders of magnitude. Is the, just, or oh, as I told you a few slides ago, the uh, marine ice sheet instability depends or hinges on the fact that the flux is an increasing function of the ice thickness. Uh, and uh, Christian Schiff did linear stability analysis using that expression that uh, of increasing as an increasing function of high thickness and arrived pretty much to the same conclusion that Fortman did with his uh, sort of heuristic arguments that uh, for an ice sheet to be stable, the bed has to um, increase in depth um, in the direction of ice flow. Using that more complex expression for the flux at the ground in line, we uh, did that similar, not the same, it's a similar linear stability analysis and arrived to this uh, bottom expression. It is um, quite complicated. It cannot be fit into one line. And uh, in addition to the bad slope, now in the bed, it depends on the bad curvature and also on the gradient of the 
accumulation rate. So this is the uh, last uh, heavy uh, equation slide. There won't be any more comp complications. So the question is, um, do these uh, two conditions agree? Do we really need to worry about all these complications or it's just to use a much more simpler one? And to answer uh, this question, so uh, we take a look at uh, stability of steady state positions. The top plot shows the bad elevation, uh, which is shown in, in black, this black thin line. Symbols show the steady state positions. The open symbols are stable, the crossed one are unstable. Those in blue are those for which the two uh, conditions agree. Those in green, and there are quite a few of them for those that two conditions disagree. Uh, zoom, uh, there are two uh, zoomed ones um, in the bottom. So uh, the two conditions can be correct both. So it's a stability condition, it's kind of binary, why the steady state is stable or why it's not, or why it is unstable. Uh, and to uh, determine which condition is correct, we do a time variant simulations, uh, meaning we perturb the steady state position one kilometer upstream from its steady state location denoted by the dashed line on bottom plots. So we slightly displaced the steady state position and then let it evolve with all steady state parameters. Um, the one on the left, which was on the upsloping bed, uh, advances to the steady state um, location and just uh, stays there forever, indicating that these uh, ground line position is stable, even though uh, it is on the um, upsloping bed. The one on the right, which is on the downsloping bed, tries to advance uh, from a perturbed position to the steady state position, but then retreats from it, indicating that this ground line uh, position is unstable. So, and this is on the downsloping bed. So these two examples illustrate that uh, the bad slope alone does not determine the stability condition and, and this results indicate that unfortunately we cannot get away with much simpler uh, condition based on the bad slope only and it is that much more complicated stability condition that uh, explains the uh, stability of the ground lines uh, correctly. It also indicates that the marine ice sheet instability hypothesis is not always valid or there are situations when, when one can get on uh, the stability conditions. So uh, both Workman's analysis and Schuff's analysis, they were done on the very specific set of um, assumptions. Uh, the uh, geometric and dynamic assumptions. The geometric assumptions are that the marine ice sheets are unconfined, that the beds are very flat or bed slopes are very ne negligible. And the dynamic assumption that uh, the dominant balance of the ice flow is between the driving strengths and basal stress, meaning the bed exhibits fairly strong basal resistance. And of course, um, both of this analysis, they were um, interested and focused on the steady state conditions. Under these uh, assumptions, if it's uh, all four of these assumptions satisfied that it is true that the flux at the ground line is an increasing function of the ice thickness. In the past decade, there were numbers of, of studies, although unintentionally, all of them um, tested uh, those uh, hypotheses individually, starting from the bottom of the slide. Christian Schultz with uh, colleagues considered the uh, laterally confined configuration characteristics characteristic of Greenland marine outlet glaciers, and they concluded that um, the flux is not an increasing function of ice thickness, and consequently, uh, the marine ice sheet instability hypothesis cannot be applied for those configurations. 
Uh, there was like a huge number of studies. These are just um, several examples that were focused on the effects of buttressing, so-called buttressing, on the uh, considered confined configurations, confined ice games and ice shelves. And uh, they concluded that the grounding lines can be stable on upsloping beds in presence of um, lateral confinement. I just showed you that if ice streams flow on beds uh, with bumps or uh, with appreciable topography where the bed slopes cannot be neglected, then once again, the stability is not determined by the bad slope alone. A little bit earlier, uh, Duncan and I looked at the configuration characteristic of siphon coast ice streams, where beds are indeed extremely flat, but they are also very slippery. And uh, as a consequence, the divergence of the longitudinal stress plays an important role in the momentum balance of ice streams. So uh, effectively, if those uh, geometric and uh, dynamic uh, assumptions are not satisfied, marine ice sheet instability cannot be applied for uh, those configurations. So all uh, those studies that I just showed on the previous slide, they were focused on steady state conditions and considered uh, only the um, steady state configurations. However, it is um, not uncommon to come across statements like climate change triggers marine ice sheet instability. And if one looks uh, very quickly, and it, I did a very cursory look at uh, climate records, this plot shows an example of reconstruction from isotope measurements from EPICA ice records. And it, uh, what are uh, obvious or what this plot demonstrates that the conditions, uh, cl uh, climate conditions are never in steady state. They vary on an uh, extremely wide range, range of temporal scales. I would not uh, read too much into the numbers, especially if you of accumulation rates. Um, the whole point of this um, graph is to illustrate that conditions do vary in time and quite substantially. So, and the last the part of this talk or the rest of this talk will focus on the question, what happens to the ground line if the uh, environmental conditions are allowed to vary with time? And to do so, we are going to visit two never worlds. Each never world has two ice sheets, green and blue. These uh, ice sheets rest on a very gently sloped bed. Um, the green one is on the downsloping bed, the blue one on the upsloping bed. These are steady state configurations that we obtained with the constant accumulation rate and the um, uh, sliding parameter. Uh, these configurations do conform with the marine ice sheet instability. And this is just to illustrate uh, the uh, ground line position of the green one is stable. When it is perturbed from its steady state position, it returns to the steady state position, which is the dashed line. Uh, the blue ice sheet, which uh, uh, has the ground in line position on upsloping bed, it is unstable. It tries to advance, but then it retreats. So in uh, the first never world is climate change. So uh, the accumulation rate varies in time uh, with a period of thousand years. This cycle repeats over and over um, again. The, maximum accumulation rate is always the same as the minimum is always the same and the portion of the grounded part um, receives uh, that uh, experiences net accumulation is always the same and the portion that experiences the net ablation is the same so the cycles repeats over and over again uh, let's see what happens to the green ice sheet first the top panel on this animation shows how the accumulation rate changes with time and space. The bottom panel shows the, only the grounded part of the ice sheet. The grounded line is marked by the vertical dashed line. 
and the color shows the surface speed or the speed that's vertically integrated. So uh, the grounding line oscillates and this plot summarizes how the grounding line position changes with time. So it also it starts in a steady state position, then it oscillates for quite a while, about 180 year cycles, and then it disappears completely. So for all um, grounding line positions on the down sloping beds, and according to marine ice sheet instability hypothesis, all those grounding line positions are stable, but nevertheless, even with the same cycle that repeats over and over and again, after 160,000 years, the ice sheet completely disappears. So if you take a look at the blue ice sheet, the same set of plots, um, top panel is the accumulation, how it changes with time, the bottom shows the grounded portion of the ice sheet, again, it oscillates, keeps oscillating, uh, just for the sake of time, let's take a look at the ground evolution of the ground line with time. So it starts and oscillates and gets into this oscillating cycle. Once again, the ground line is always on upsloping bed, which is unstable according to the marine ice sheet instability hypothesis. I ran it for two million years, hoping it will do something different, but it repeats exactly the same cycle, never going anywhere. So it just oscillates on the upsloping bed. So uh, let's take a closer look to one cycle. So these are the same plots that you know, just saw on a couple of previous slides. Uh, the um, bottom panels show the grounding line position during one cycle. Uh, these are left axis. The red lines are the reads of the migration rate, uh, the rates of the ground line migration. Sorry, the point uh, of those plots to illustrate that the retreat rates or the magnitude of retreat rates, the negative values, they have larger magnitudes than the positive ones, the rates of advance of the ground line, meaning that even if the forcing or the oscillation in accumulation rate, they are always symmetric, it's just a sine wave. Uh, there is the ground line migration is not symmetric, so the, it retreats faster and then it takes longer to advance to uh, in the cycle, but these cycles repeat all the time. Now, if we do exactly the same exercise, but using uh, flux parameterization with Schultz expression, and everything is the same, the only thing that instead that uh, the flux is used in, as a parameterization, uh, the ground line positions um, don't behave in the same way as in full model. So the uh, results of with these parameterizations are red lines of this plot for the uh, ground line or for a simulation that uh, for the green ice sheet that um, with the ground line on the down sloping bed, it gets into this oscillating cycle while in the full simulation, the uh, ground line completely retreats and the ice sheet disappears for the blue ice sheet with the ground in line or the steady state ground in line position on the upsloping bed. Um, they kind of repeat in one cycle, but then the ground in line diverges and for the parameterized one, the ground in line advances to the edge of quote unquote continental shelf, illustrating that the uh, behavior is quite different in uh, with the parameterized uh, simulations. Uh, the ground lines can exhibit very different behaviors uh, and very different uh, from those that I just showed you. If the parameters um, changed in those simulations, these are just examples where the ground line of the uh, green ice sheet on the downsloping bed um, settles into cyclic behavior or it can advance um, uh, or even starting on the downslope, it advances to the edge of the quote unquote continental shelf. And um, uh, for the blue um, 
I sheet for different a uh, combination of parameters, although the uh, shape is exactly the same. It's just slightly different values of uh, maximum and minimum accumulation rates and the portion of the grounded uh, part of the ice sheet that uh, experiences net accumulation or net ablation, so it can either retreat or advance. Now let's go to a different metal world, which is called sliding change. So sliding parameters can change quite or can have quite large um, variation in magnitudes. So uh, in this never world, the sliding parameter changes. So it uh, increases and its magnitude increases and decreases on uh, with a period of 25,000 years. So it's much longer than in the previous never world. All, uh, in this never world, it's just the sliding parameters that changes. The accumulation rate is constant in space and time. It doesn't change at all. So uh, it will be hopefully more obvious. The top panel shows the evolution of the basal shear. And the bottom panel again shows the evolution of the grounded port portion of the marine ice sheet. Um, so. I'll play this animation again. These are just two cycles. It retreats very rapidly in about like 3,000 years, and for the rest, 20 to 24,000 years, it advances, then it does, repeats the cycle. This is for the blue ice sheet. It's exactly the same cycle, it's just timing slightly different, but it settles in exactly the same cycling pattern. And in this case, it oscillates between two sides of the bed, uh, the upsloping part and the downsloping part with exactly 25,000 years, but the cycle is very asymmetric. So uh, the grounding line retreats very, very rapidly and advances very, very slowly. But nevertheless, it doesn't go anywhere. And in this never world, um, as I said, the accumulation rate is constant. So it, all changes are driven by changes in the sliding parameter. Uh, looking at one cycle more closely, this thread cycle, once again, the left axis the ground line position as it varies with time during one cycle. As I said, the retreat is extremely rapid. The red line shows the rates of the ground in line migration. And for a fairly brief period, about uh, several hundred years, the uh, magnitudes of the rate of the ground in line migrations are orders of magnitude larger than for the rest of the cycle. So it's about 700 meters, but it's fairly, fairly briefly about two or 300 years. And then the uh, rates of the ground in line migration, they become very, very slow. Doing the same exercise with uh, using Schiff's uh, flux expression as a parameterization of flux at the ground in line. Um, so this is starting for the with the uh, steady state ice sheet on the downsloping bed. It kind of follows one cycle and then just advances to the edge of the continental shelf. So this um, exactly that cycle that um, uh, the ice sheet that uh, starts with a steady state position on downsloping bed. So it settles in the same cycle. For the ice sheet on upsloping bed, um, the parameterized ground line just moves very rapidly to the edge of continental shell. So again, uh, the behavior in two sets of simulation is quite different. And once again, if the parameters in uh, changes of sliding parameter are slightly different, then the ground lines can just advance to the edge of the continental shelf. So coming back, returning back from the never world, what can we learn from them? Uh, I hope uh, that it they illustrated to you that the marine ice sheet instability hypothesis, which is understood in the sense that grounding lines on 
retrograde beds are inherently unstable. It just simply cannot explain the results if the um, parameters change with time. So effectively, it is not relevant to ice sheets uh, experiencing time variable conditions. The basal slope alone but does not explain the grounding line behavior. So the grounding line can advance, retreat, oscillate, regardless why it's a prograde or a retrograde slope. The grounding line migration depends on the history of changes in environmental conditions. And the term, uh, short term behavior of the grounding line may not indicate the immediate response to the changes in the environmental conditions. And it also might not uh, be representative of the long-term behavior of the ground in line. So it is not an immediate response in uh, the reset uh, memory or um, uh, historic component that whatever the ground in line is doing right now, it is not necessarily in response to the changes that are happening right right now around the ice sheet. Uh, the ground in line migration can be driven by changes in basal shear. So it's just rather a reminder, I guess, um, it's not particularly surprising. The long-term changes in basal shear can cause a fairly short-term high migration rates. So it is um, quite an interesting outcome. Uh, for the past 30 years since Doug McHale, thanks to him, introduced inverse methods to glaciology, inverting for spatial distributions of basal shear uh, has become a routine. Plots on the left are just two examples showing um, probably of hundreds of papers that present similar results of how the inverse methods can be used to um, infer the spatial distribution of the basal shear. The plot on the right uh, uh, demonstrates the knowledge of the temporal evolution of the basal shear and especially long-term uh, evolution of basal shear on the ice sheets. So effectively, we need to find a way how to infer or at least get an idea about the long-term changes in basal shear. And uh, I hope it was uh, quite clear from simulations that the flux parameterization using shifts expression is not useful in time varied simulations. It works magic, it works great in uh, conditions uh, or under assumptions for which it was the, um, derived, meaning those four assumptions that I showed you, uh, you earlier. However, if those assumptions are violated, then um, the flux is not an increasing function of my sickness. So uh, you've already seen the slide, uh, just to update it, that uh, marine ice sheet instability cannot be applied to uh, geometric configurations such that laterally confined ice sheets or ice sheets on beds with non-negligible um, slopes or on ice sheets where the divergence of the longitudinal stress is important in the momentum balance and uh, marine ice sheet instability a hypothesis also cannot explain the behavior of ice sheet uh, for which conditions vary with time. And these conditions can be either external as like accumulation of climate conditions or internal as changes in basal shear. And this brings me back, or rather it brings me where I started, that um, mining ice sheet instability is rather the exception and not the rule of the behavior of the ground in line. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Olga. Um, oh, I stopped sharing, I guess. Yes, me, you, you've stopped sharing. Yeah, let um, me put it back just in case. Do you have, uh, is, does anyone have any questions for Olga? Frank, um, Frank, do you want to unmute yourself and um, ask your question. 
Uh, the, the question is, uh, thanks very much, Olga. Uh, no, the question is very straightforward. Uh, is this uh, never will behavior dependent on the periodicity of the forced oscillations that you apply? Well, yes, it does. That's why it's never world. That's why I decided like that what it is there. Uh, but um, Frank, thanks a lot for the question. Great question as usual. Uh, it is not too difficult to find a combination of parameters for different periodicities and just find a different set of parameters that uh, would have a similar, not necessarily exactly the same, but somewhat similar behavior. Uh, Jing Yao Lei, I see a hand raised. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks for thanks for a really um, interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, so I'm very interested in this um, time variance experiment. And um, so you mentioned for different values of accumulation rate and different basal sliding factors um, that can, those, those parameters can all affect the result of whether the grounding line stabilized or not. And I was just wondering, um, are there ways to, um, what, what are the fundamental parameters that determine um, if the grounding line will be stable at the end or not? Um, I, can you well, group together um, different parameters into dimensionless groups, for example? Or are there just too many parameters that it's hard to uh, uh, actually, here it's uh, Razi uh, quite few parameters. So uh, the reason the uh, I can separate them. So first of all, the model is a vertically integrated model. So in terms of the parameters, it is the ice stiffness and the um, basal sliding that count the count um, the uh, physics representing in the accumulation rate, which is the external climate parameter. Uh, so, in terms of grouping, uh, yes, it is possible to uh, create a non-dimensional parameter, which is the ratio um, of the driving stress to the basal shear. And that's pretty much uh, one of the uh, other parameter is the um, deformational parameter, which is the ratio of the internal deformation to the driving stress. Uh, why is the, the ice sheet, like uh, in, in terms of the time dependent behavior, so um, uh, I was going to, I was hoping to make it clear that the ground in line response is a response to the changing conditions. So in that regard, it does depend uh, on the uh, changes either in accumulation rate and it is externally determined by the climate. So, uh, or uh, changes um, in the sliding parameter, which are determined um, by processes which are not either resolved nor represented in this very simple model. So it's everything that happens and um, at the base of the ice sheet. So whatever hardening of the sediments, um, perhaps in uh, most likely subglacial hydrology, erosion, deposition, everything I just lumped it in into the sliding parameter and made it very on very long time scales. So that was the uh, purpose of this plot to illustrate that this is the state of knowledge how, uh, about the temporal evolution of basal shear on the ice sheets. I personally do not know uh, how even to determine how um, those changes happen and what time scales and what at all about changes in basal conditions. Right, but it's great to see these are actually really important for well, I guess we, we knew that they are important in Trazi illustrating or highlighting the changes in those conditions um, can make quite large, uh, can have quite large effects on the ground and line. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. There's a comment there from Doug. Do you want to unmute yourself, Doug, or just? 
let us all read on the chat. I'll just say great talk, Olga. Uh, <laughs> Thank really you, Doug. Thank you. Because, you know, it, it, having an intuitive understanding of marine ice sheet instability is so important for everyone, especially people who are starting out in glaciology. And I think you've developed a way of explaining it that is um, really easy to grasp. So thank you very much. My pleasure. You're uh, always welcome to borrow. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Olga? Questions or comments? I can't see any, so um, I'm going to uh, attempt to share the uh, title slide for next week's seminar, which arrived literally as we were uh, finishing today, uh, today's seminar. Um, um, next week's seminar is being given by Julian Shafut from the University of Texo at El Paso, and she's going to talk to us about singing snow, um, seismic waves in Antarctic fern. So I'd like to encourage uh, everyone to come to that next week, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to Olga for today's seminar. Um, really really clear dis uh, description um i agree with doug it was great so thank you very much indeed thank you thank you debbie and thank you to all for attending whatever time it is i secretly hope uh, that the fact that the talk is uh, recorded so if you didn't get something you can always just go and watch a particular piece and yes please um let me know i'll be happy to answer any questions so i hope that uh, that bit about the marine ice sheet instability that everybody uses that it becomes quite clear and people can easily understand how what it is about it it's not that scary <laughs> not at all well your secret uh, desire is uh, is manifest we we have a recording and it's also on facebook so uh, it will be on youtube sometime tomorrow morning so Indeed, anyone who hasn't seen it or anyone who wants to see it again will be able to see it on, on um, YouTube. So thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you, Olga. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Magnus. Bye. Bye.